You are listening to Pass the Chipotle, the show that will take you to discover the edible treasures of Mexico. Episode 4. This week, we'll talk about Diana Kennedy, the Essex lady who came, saw, and was conquered by Mexico's gastronomy. We'll find out what the Habsburg emperors ate during the very short Mexican reign, and we'll discover which are the squidgy, crunchy, and chewy insects that the indigenous Mexicans ate way before it was cool. Hello, hello, you are listening to Paz de Chipotle, the audible companion to Sabor, this is Mexican food magazine, the tastiest combo to guide you into the kitchens, markets, streets and traditions that make Mexico an edible paradise. I'm your host, Rocío Carvajal, food historian, cook and author. You can find more information about this project at pazdechipotle.com. Find the show on Twitter as Chipotle Podcast. Thank you so much to all the listeners who got in touch. Thank you for taking the time to send your comments and feedback. Now, let's get on with the show. Very few people in recent history have become living national treasures in more than one country and during their lifetime. But of all the travelers that have come to Mexico and fell under the spell of the country's many wonders, we can perhaps count two that have had a deep impact through their work and publications that documented life, culture, and traditions. One was the Prussian naturalist Friedrich Wilhelm Heinrich Alexander von Humboldt, whose works reshaped the course of natural science archaeology, social history, and anthropology in Mexico at the turn of the 19th century. And only 153 years later, in 1957, came Diane Kennedy. Little did this woman know that it will be in Mexico where she will find in the traditional cuisines of the country her life's passion, which would lead her to become the undisputed champion of Mexican cultural gastronomic studies. Although now she is a member of the Order of the Aztec Eagle and of the Order of the British Empire, with nine multi-award winning books and numerous articles published, the young Essex girl didn't quite imagine that after moving to Mexico and marrying American journalist Paul Kennedy, she will become the Marcella Hassan, Florence White and Elizabeth David of Mexican cuisine. To many, it may sound romantic and even familiar the idea of traveling half the world to follow the person you love. But what came next for Diana was a very unusual story. While Paul Kennedy, her husband, worked as a political correspondent, Diana had the opportunity to discover and explore Mexico's gastronomy. She very quickly understood that food was like an edible postcard from the past, and she felt the need to explore beyond the conventional cookery classes and oversimplified cookbooks. So, she packed her notebooks and went on to explore the markets, interviewing traditional cooks, studying, documenting and understanding the nature and transformation of native ingredients and cooking all that catalogue of traditional family recipes from all over Mexico became almost a natural consequence. Diana started teaching Mexican cooking at her house in New York soon after moving to America and was approached to contribute as a food writer for the New York Times. Even after the tragic sudden death of her husband, she continued furthering her career and became a household name as a traditional Mexican food expert in her own right. As a writer, public speaker, cook and researcher, Diana gave the English-speaking world the opportunity to have for the first time an encounter with a little explored and even less understood cuisine, that is, outside Mexico, of course. But the effect of her work also transformed Mexicans' understanding of the national gastronomic traditions, because before her books came to exist, 
there was a rather atomized view of the regional traditions, and it was this very comprehensive view and analysis that enabled a deeper understanding of the evolution and characteristics of the country's edible heritage. So just as Humboldt helped us rediscover Mexico, Diane Kennedy takes her readers to a magical journey where she shares her surprise, respect and passion for the complex social and cultural phenomena that is Mexican gastronomy. So on behalf of my country, thank you Diana. May forever frothy chocolate cups be raised in your honor. We will continue with the show after this message. I'm really happy to tell you that the spring issue of Sabor, This is Mexican Food, a quarterly digital magazine dedicated to the exploration of Mexico's gastronomic heritage and traditions, is out and ready for you to purchase. The spring issue includes six full in-depth articles exploring the origins of Mexican traditional food, its staple ingredients and the flavors that define it, and five delicious recipes to get you started into the wonderful world of Mexican cooking. Go to pasachipotle.com forward slash magazine to take a sneak peek inside this issue. Purchase your copy now and enjoy it in all your digital devices. Go to pasachipotle.com forward slash magazine and get ready to cook, learn and enjoy Mexican food like you never imagined. One of the oddest episodes in Mexico's history is the brief and confusing Austrian Empire, which resulted in a rather embarrassing event for those who were involved and ended up in a very sad tragedy. Mexico was going through a very difficult time during the first years of the 1860s. After achieving its independence from Spain in 1810, the political class remained very divided between those who pushed forward the Republican project and the Royalists who were ready to do anything to regain their privileges. After the Reform War, by 1860, the Liberal government, led by Benito Juárez, finally passed a set of radical laws that stripped the Catholic Church of its political, economic and cultural power approving a unique model of secular public education and significantly reducing the influence of the Mexican army in politics. Meanwhile, in Europe, Napoleon III, nephew to Napoleon I, was desperate to surpass his uncle's achievements, and following his successful investments in the constructions of the Suez Canal, he developed an interest for expanding the French Empire in the American continent, and decided to invade Mexico and create an empire under his political influence. Well, it was a great plan. He just needed an ambitious, naive and easy to manipulate noble to volunteer to become emperor of Mexico. For years, he had groomed Ferdinand Maximilian Joseph of the House of Habsburg, who really had no chance to succeed in his brother, Francis Joseph I, emperor of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And, with the support of Mexican royalists, he convinced Maximilian and his young wife Charlotte of Belgium that the Mexican people were absolutely desperate to have another absolutist government and would welcome them as emperors. After two military campaigns, France managed to have the conditions to send Maximilian and Charlotte to Mexico in 1864 on the false pretenses to an extremely polarized and volatile country. Curiously enough, the cultural footprint that the three-year empire left was enough to encourage the conservative aspiring middle classes to fully adopt a fashionable and sophisticated lifestyle. Soon, the opening of fine restaurants in affluent cities offered French menus that had no room for unrefined traditional food. In the city of Mexico alone, 111 patisseries opened and the most famous were owned by French bakers like Louis Renault and the Plaisons Fuerts. Balls, soirees, banquets and concerts were frequently offered at the emperor's residence in Chapultepec. Along with a young couple came the Hungarian head chef Joseph Tudos, 
who was in charge of a little army of cooks at the imperial kitchens and produced many releves, oysters, braised fillets, souffles, sponges, ices, pottery croissants, lady fingers, and fancy fondants by the dozens. But to the dismay of the emperor's supporters, the royal couple turned to be very liberal and progressive in their ideas and policies. Maximilian himself was bewitched by Mexico's beauty and traditions, and he refused to use his carriage and instead ride on his horse through the beautiful avenues of Mexico City, dressed in full charro suit. To this day, Mexico still has a big passion for pastries, and the staple Viennese croissant is by far one of the national favorites, smothered with butter and dunked in milky hot chocolate. In more than one occasion, Charlotte sneaked onto the working class districts of the city to drink pulque and eat enchiladas just like the rest of working class Mexicans. And Maximilian demanded to eat cheese stuffed chiles, tortillas, mole and drink pulque as often as possible, much to the amazement and embarrassment of their pompous Mexican court. But bad beginnings make bad endings. And sooner than later, the lies and the illusion of an imperial stability crumbled. And just as Maximilian himself was in favor of a more liberal and even republican model, the legitimate president of Mexico regained control of the country, and Juarez ordered the execution and subsequent banishment of Charlotte from the country. One thing is sure, wines, patisseries, bakeries and French cooking techniques transformed forever food in Mexico and influenced the creation of new dishes that combined the best of both gastronomies, one with a non-canny variety of ingredients and the other with refined methods that could only result in a delicious new cuisine filled with spiced brioches, pecan souffles, tropical tarts and even with la coche crepes. Luckily for us, this exciting culinary moment was captured in two famous cookery manuals under the titles of Novissimo Arte de Cocina, or Newest Cookery Art, published in 1831, promising affordable methods to prepare Spanish, French, Italian, and English dishes, and the book New Mexican Cook in the form of a dictionary, published in 1888. You can find the links on the blog post of this episode at pasachipotle.com. We return with the last section of the show after this message. The production of Paz de Chipotle requires endless hours of hard work and dedication to bring you an interesting and refreshing show for you to enjoy. And to keep this exciting project alive, I need your support. Independent creators like myself bring diversity, empowerment and opportunities to enrich our global cultural exchange which is why the support of audiences with a passion for knowledge and creativity is essential. You can support this podcast by making a monthly donation on the show's page on Patreon. Go to patreon.com forward slash Chipotle Podcast. By helping the show grow, you will also get great rewards, such as exclusive access to posts and transcripts of the show, delicious recipes, and even the chance to decide which topics you would like to hear in future episodes. Go to patreon.com forward slash Chipotle Podcast and select the type of donation you want to make. Every donation makes a big difference. Go to patreon.com forward slash Chipotle Podcast and be part of this delicious story. The effortless way in which we can purchase all sorts of foods and ingredients from different latitudes by calmly walking through the sections of our local supermarket is a far cry from the back-breaking effort our ancient ancestors had to go through in order to obtain food. It was mainly by chance rather than choice that the first sedentary groups of humans shaped their diets in a very specific way because they pretty much ate what was available. I didn't frown at the prospect of easily obtainable food. For whatever climatological reason, not all animals decided to migrate to North America. 
and big mammals such as camels and antelopes decided to stay in Africa, while horses chose to stay in what is today Canada and part of the USA. But in exchange, we have one of the world's largest concentrations of biodiversity, including all sorts of mammals, birds, fish, reptiles, and thousands and thousands of insects. Consequentially, the ancient people of Mexico decided that entomophagy, or eating, crawling, flying, and jumping insects, was a really good idea to complement the rather frugal diet. Delicious and nutritious bugs like crunchy locusts, mosquitoes, grasshoppers, popping flies' eggs and larvae, squidgy moths, caterpillars, juicy beetles, ants' eggs, and delightful dragonflies were well-established ingredients in the pre-Columbian diet. Even the Spanish conquerors at their arrival had the chance to mm, enjoy such delicacies. Once the colony was established, and after the successful introduction of farming animals such as goats, sheep, pigs, and chickens, the consumption of insects remained present, at least amongst the indigenous and mestizo population, that is, the people of mixed heritage, and survived as an almost hidden practice away from the judging European eyes. But in recent decades, these practices of gathering and farming insects have regained recognition and now they have become a source of culinary pride for cooks to preserve these dishes and for Mexicans to reincorporate them into their diets. Some examples of these edible insects that are proudly prepared in the central high plains of Mexico are escamoles, which are ants' eggs, also called Aztec caviar. They are enjoyed sautéed with onion and butter. A woutle are mosquitoes, larvae and eggs which are found in lakes and lagoons. They're cooked in fried patties. Tapulines, or grasshoppers, are perhaps the most common edible insects in the country. They are toasted and seasoned with lime and chili. Gusanos de maguey are the big larvae of a moth that drills holes in the thick agave leaves. After they're picked, they're washed, fried, and served with guacamole and salsas. They can be enjoyed as a main dish or as a snack. The red smaller variety of these caterpillars are used to flavor mezcales from Oaxaca. And finally, we have jumiles, which are smoke sting bugs eaten either dead or alive. If dead, they're toasted and seasoned with salt. If eaten alive, they're served with a fiery salsa and soft tortillas to make tacos. Nowadays, the nutritional value of insects is recognized worldwide. Mexico is particularly lucky not only for having a wide variety of edible insects, but also for maintaining the traditional ways to prepare and enjoy them. So, next time you visit Mexico, set your squeamishness aside and try one of the many seasonal, crunchy or squidgy, delicious insects. so much for listening this episode of Paz de Chipotle, a bi-weekly show dedicated to the exploration of Mexico's delicious gastronomic traditions. Don't miss the next episode, where I'll take you to navigate along the floating allotments of Xochimilco, the so-called Venice of the Aztec Empire. We'll invite ourselves to Frida Kahlo and Diego Rivera's wedding, and we'll find out which non-edible plant accompanied pre-Columbian aperitifs and digestives alike. I'll give you a clue. Sir Walter Raleigh went bonkers for it when he was introduced to this plant. You can get in touch via email or Twitter. Links and contact details are in the show's description. Support the show on Patreon. Patreon is the largest platform that connects creators with bright audiences like you. To find more information about the show and Sabor, this is Mexican Magazine, go to pasdechipotle.com. That's it for this week. Thank you for tuning in. Subscribe, rate, and share this show. Goodbye from me, or as we say in Mexico, hasta la próxima, amigos. <laughs>